Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is, it is time for another episode of Alter Your Health. This is your source of information and inspiration to promote the holistic transformation of your health and the health of our planet. And I'm Dr. Benjamin Alter. I am a licensed naturopathic doctor and the host of this podcast. And my passion and mission is supporting people through holistic lifestyle medicine, specifically using food as medicine, showing people how their body does in fact heal itself, and also leveraging the power of understanding how the mind works and how we can use that powerful mind that you have to support the healing process as well. Super cool stuff. That's what I love to do. And I am doing it through our practice at www.alter.health. And the newest offering that we have at Alter Health is our medicinal living six-week online self-paced educational transformational course this thing is awesome it is designed to guide you into your healthiest lifestyle i could speak on it for hours and i have uh, spoken on it for hours before so i'm not going to do that in this episode of course this episode is about our guest juliana hever who is the plant-based dietitian she has been doing a lot of great work in the realm of plant-based nutrition she has authored a couple books including the idiot's guide to plant to plant-based nutrition as well as the vegetarian diet both books are great resources filled with lots of information and her newest book is actually going to be launched in the end of this year december of 2019 and she has co-authored it with ray cronice and this book is the health span solution and i am looking forward to get my hands on a copy of it in this conversation we talk a little bit about the science and the health span solution we talk about juliana's journey into the realm of plant-based nutrition we talk about how actually when we're looking at a protein bar we might want to focus on the protein bar with the least amount of protein rather than the most amount of protein if our goal is experiencing health and uh, longevity and so these are just some things that we touch on in this conversation and I don't want to blabber too much I want to dive right in but before we do just want to remind new or old listeners if you haven't yet given a rating or review to this podcast I would be so grateful if you took the 20 or 30 seconds however long it takes just to do that click those buttons let me know how things are going let me know how this information is landing And if you would also be so kind to share this stuff with someone who might also be touched and inspired by, you know, interacting with this information, that would be great. Just shoot it off in an email or a text or better yet, when we're having when you're having a conversation, you can just share this podcast. Say, hey, I listened to this podcast, this conversation between Juliana Hever and this guy, Dr. Benjamin Alter. It was good stuff. Uh, So anyways, thanks for being here. Thanks for tuning in. And I will shut up and let the beautiful Juliana take over in this conversation. So hope you do enjoy this one. Let's dive in. All right. Hello, Juliana Heber, and welcome to the Alter Your Health podcast. So happy to have you on. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, I've been a fan of your work and your writing and your speaking and everything that you've been putting out in the world concerning plant-based nutrition and just showing people how easy and delicious and straightforward it is. Uh, And I'd like to know a little bit more about your professional career. Has it always been plant-based or when did you really take the dive into plant-based nutrition? No, it wasn't always plant-based. I started as a personal trainer, really, in this business many, many, many years ago, and while I was in graduate school. So while I was studying nutrition and becoming an RD and all that, I was, you know, I was teaching kind of the traditional personal trainer diet, you know, protein and veggies, protein and veggies. Like, that was the big thing that I was doing with a lot of my clients. And then it wasn't until after I finished graduate school where I really dove in even deeper than I had previously to what well, wasn't really called plant-based nutrition back then. It was more like, I don't know, vegetarian or whatever they used to call it, but it wasn't, we never really said plant-based, but I started kind of seeing more and more of the evidence and just diving a little real deep into it. And 
I finally made the switch completely on myself about 14 years ago. Could not believe how much better I felt and how it just healed lifelong issues I had had physically. I thought, well, if it's so good for me, I'm going to try it with my clients. And that was like right about the time that I got, I finished my RD. So it's been exactly 14 years. My daughter just had her 14th birthday and it happened right when she was born. <laughs> so oh, I can't believe it. time flies. Um, and so uh, that was when I switched. I switched with my clients and that's when I started seeing clients more as a dietitian. I, I stopped training. And I mean, the, the, what I've seen with everyone else has been absolutely extraordinary. So there was no going back. What was the initial inspiration 14 years ago? Was there a book or a movie or a teacher or something of some sort? It had started when I was a teenager. So many, many years ago, I started reading about all of it and I was really intrigued by it. And I tried it, but I didn't really know what I was doing. And I always, I like to not date myself, but there was no real internet or like a lot of access and I didn't know anyone who was eating that way. So it took me quite a while to feel confident with it and to really understand it. and. I felt really excited when I had the opportunity to write The Idiot's Guide to Plant-Based Nutrition because that's kind of what I wish I'd had, where I just kind of knew how to, I was as like a guide of how to eat this way. So it took me a while uh, and it was, it was graduate school. I started questioning things where I would realize, oh, this says, you know, this handout says I have to ha recommend my patients eat three servings of dairy every day, but then it was sponsored by the Dairy Council and this little fine print on the bottom. So I had a lot of kind of like aha moments throughout the process. I took seven years going through school because I was working full time. I got married in the middle. It was like all this craziness. Um, but it, so it was a long journey, uh, but it started with books and reading and it just kind of unfolded in a slow, but surely confident process. So there wasn't a real light bulb moment or it sounds like maybe there were many light bulb moments and many aha moments, like you said, but it wasn't really one definitive thing. Yeah, it was collective. It was a collective series of aha moments. <laughs> right. When you were going through and getting your RD, were you also, um, uh, it, it sounds like you were kind of going against the grain a little bit in terms of what you were learning, what you were kind of teaching yourself and your awareness. Would you say that a lot of your, your colleagues at that time were on the same page as you or were you kind of an outlier? You know, it wasn't so clear back then. It wasn't like I was eating this way and arguing with everyone. It was more like I was still really a personal trainer while I was doing this, while I was studying. And you know, you're taking most of the classes. A lot of people ask me, well, I don't wanna learn about animal products and I don't wanna teach that traditional way. So I don't wanna go to school and, and be stuck in that situation. And I don't think that opportunity, I don't think that comes up so much because organic chemistry has nothing to do with it. Microbiology, food science, there's so much that really has nothing to do with whether or not you're gonna include animal products in what you're recommending. So it didn't come up that much. And I wasn't completely 100% plant-based yet because it was I wasn't there yet. Um, but I was always, I'm not afraid to be disruptive and you know, I'm, I'm always good with having arguments and, <laughs> and, um, and not being on the same page as people. I kind of I've never really stood on the same page as people. So, I, didn't, I think now it would be different because now there's a clear cut, oh, I follow a plant-based diet, I follow the paleo diet, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. I think it would be a little different right now, but there aren't that many classes where it would kind of come to fruition, where it would come to a head. And even if it did, there's so much science now that you know, if you're, it's easy. It's so much easier to support the reasons that we recommend this way of eating. So mm -hmm. no, I didn't really butt heads with anyone specifically about whether or not to include animal products, but it was a real kind of exciting opportunity to explore and really look at the science in different ways from different perspectives. Mm -hmm. It's interesting to hear that you are have a good uh, and easy time having arguments with people because when I hear you speak and uh, you know, read your writing and that sort of thing. You just seem like a very, you know, agreeable sort of person able to, you know, relate with everyone and anyone. Uh, so tell me some times where you have butted heads. What, what does that look like? And uh, maybe what are some things that you currently, like what are some current pet peeves in the nutrition world that you just can't stand hearing? Oh my gosh, you're so perceptive. Okay, first of all, thank you for saying that. <laughs> I, that means a lot to me because yeah, I am very agreeable and I don't like, um, what's the word, when you're not- Con Confrontation or- Yeah, definitely or, not 
confrontational, but also like when you don't, when you want everything really peaceful, <laughs> you don't want to You're argue. Peacekeeper. Peacekeeper. Yeah. But, and I am, and I don't try to instigate arguments. And actually, I, I guess I probably misspoke. It's a little exaggeration because I don't like to argue. I don't like to debate. Oh. And fortunately, I'm working now with Ray Cronice, who is really good at that, and he actually enjoys it. <laughs> so, like, if there's something going on on social media, I'm like, okay. It took me many years to get to the point where it's funny that you notice that I am I'm done. I'm not trying to convince anyone. If you, I'm not. I stopped. I was trying so hard. Like when I first went to eat this way and started teaching this way, I was like, I wanted everyone to eat this way, and I wanted to convince everyone that they needed to eat this way. But it was like beating my head against the wall. It's like you know what. No, I know it's so beneficial. I've experienced, I've witnessed now personally hundreds of people have massive transformations with their health. But if you don't want to do it, don't do it. You know, it's your body, you know, if, but if you want me to help you, I'm happy to help you like that. I want to be there to support them. But yeah, I don't, don't try to get into the debates. I try to avoid them. I don't think they're really necessary or constructive, but I guess they can be if you're really, I guess, if that's kind of the path you want to go, like Ray does. <laughs> Uh, but there's a lot, I have a lot of pet peeves what's going on now. Mostly it's that, that people are just trying to like, you know, mm -hmm. argue in these kind of circle, circular arguments, you know, with um, yeah, just a lot of things like with this whole carnivore craze and, you know, all that stuff. But the evidence is so clear as to the potential harms of eating, the, the harms of eating animal products and of not including a lot of plant products. So it's, there's just so much support out there right now, evidence wise that I just, I don't know why people are, I mean, they people want to hear what they want to hear and they want to go in the direction they want to go, go in no matter what the science says. Yeah, totally. Well, what if I were to, you know, I'm curious what you say because I'm just personally curious as to how you respond to things like this when people say, oh, well, you know, I was, uh, you know, a, a vegetarian or I was a plant-based vegan and I got really sick and then, you know, I went on this carnivore thing and all my symptoms got better and I feel great. Like, how do you, how do you respond to someone who's coming at you with that sort of personal anecdotal claim with regard to their nutrition? Yeah, I, that's so funny because I was just, I, today I was scrolling through YouTube while I was blow drying my hair, you know, I, that's when I kind of go <laughs> and I stumbled upon one of those videos. I'm like, okay, I'll watch one again. I, I kind of stopped watching them. But it's just the sheer ridiculousness of some of these statements that, I, I mean, I, I'm, I was yelling at my screen. I'm like, this is ridiculous. Like, it's crazy to say that, you know, oh, I, I was eating tons and tons and tons of, you know, burgers and soy foods. And, and now, you know, then I, my period stopped. I'm like, just stuff that you're just like, well, what, what were you really eating? And how, and I don't want to argue about it. It's like, okay, if you don't feel good, then fine. But yeah, you're going to be bloated if all of a sudden you're switching to a high fiber diet. A lot of people say, oh, I was bloated all the time. Well, you know, it, take, it takes time to adjust to that. It depends. Okay. So let me just simplify that. It depends on what people are saying. Cause there's a lot of claims out there. I don't think that, you know, people, this is a big pet peeve of mine too. People that are like, I was craving meat so bad. I knew I needed it. You know, it's like, well, you know, I crave chocolate or some people crave chocolate that doesn't mean they need it or the cravings don't mean anything or or cocaine or alcohol yeah. or <laughs> or a cigarette I mean yeah those yeah. are whatever it has nothing to do with a need for it it's not like you're having a meat deficiency you know we don't see that so I, I can't believe how many people go off and do that. It's fine to say, I don't want to eat plant-based anymore. I'm not vegan anymore. Okay, fine. But to claim that your health is better because you included animal products, mm. you know, it is, it's anecdotes. So mm. the claims I've heard are just kind of preponderous and ridiculous. And like you said, N of one, they're just, you know, these are anecdotes. So the science on like, if you look at what people do, most people do really well. Now on the other side of that, you know, I can't honestly say that, people that include up to maybe a little bit of animal products in their diet can't do wonderfully well. You know, I can't say you have to omit all animal products in your diet for optimal health. Can't, I can't honestly say that as a dietitian because, you know, if you look at the blue zones and all of that, there is some, most of those, in fact, almost all of them, four out of five of them do include a little bit of animal products, but they use, yeah, a, yeah, yeah condiment size, exactly, as opposed to center of the plate. So, do we need to be completely vegan to have all these benefits? I don't know, probably not, but definitely the evidence supports eating way less and, and you, can, you can be fine without any of those animal products. 
but the whole idea that, oh, I needed it because I'm having a deficiency and because all of my health was failing by eating plants. It's like, well, what were you actually eating? Like, how could that, I just, I, the hundreds of people I've seen in the hundreds or thousands of papers I've read, it just doesn't seem to, to make sense. Right. Yeah. So it sounds like your, your approach to those kind of people is just to kind of like not get all tangled up in it emotionally and <laughs> argumentatively, which can happen to the best of us like me. I can <laughs> be like, come on, really? Um, but yeah, I hear a lot of people also saying that, well, you know, there's never been a full, like more than one generation of fully plant-based veganism. So it's hard to, you know, like we're, we're talking about with the blue zones, there there is a little bit of meat. So it's like a lot of people think that cutting out meat altogether is a health risk because it's just never been done and it's too risky and extreme. Uh, but but what do you think about that? Just because there hasn't been gen multiple generations of fully plant-based vegan, do you think that that's something to um, tread cautiously in terms of adopting a fully plant-based whole food vegan diet? That's a really good question. Uh, I don't, I don't know if we have the answer to that. I think it's a very, it's a good question that we should all consider. But that said, we all, no matter what diet you're eating or what way of way you're eating, I think everyone needs to be conscientious. I think everyone needs to get labs drawn every year, no matter what you're following, no matter what you're eating or not eating. Everyone should monitor. I mean, like, are you doing well? You know, are you, you know, are you deficient? And I mean, I think people really need to consider supplementing, no matter what diet they're on. People need to be um, diligent about what they're actually composing their diet of. So that's why I don't even like the term vegan because it just says what you're not eating. And nowadays with this onslaught of all these processed junk foods that are quite literally making people sick, I'm concerned about that term. So I'm more concerned about what people are eating. And I think people need to take responsibility for learning what they need to have in a healthy diet, no matter what, whether or not it includes animal products. And there is no diet. We always say there is no perfect diet. You know, you have to be careful. You have to, you know, we need to have B12 and there's certain nutrients that we need to be aware of and omitting them could put yourself at risk. So yeah, there, there probably, there's definitely risk. There's risk of any way of eating. Yeah, that's a good point. And certainly, you know, a huge topic in terms of all of the, the processed vegan food, the processed plant food. And uh, so, you know, I can kind of certainly sense your thoughts on it, but do you think it's ultimately uh, a good direction to go in? Or do you think that it's, because usually how I talk about it or relate to it as it, it's just kind of like a good, it's a step in the right direction. It's like a bridging, a bridge for some people. Uh, but how do you see these kind of processed plant-based meat substitutes? And, you know, they are hyper-processed, but how do you relate to them? I love that you said a bridge. I think that's a great way to say it. But, and I, you know, I'm torn because I'm excited that there are options. I'm excited that you can go to all of these fast food places now, pretty much almost anywhere and get... Mm -hmm plant version of what you would have had not plant animal well food. i'm sure that you you're not personally excited you're you're probably not driving through and ordering your plant based substitute of junk food uh, but you're excited that the standard american has that option it sounds like exactly exactly i'm i'm not excited about them and i'm concerned i'm actually very concerned so when i speak to vegan audiences or at veg fest or whatnot my concern stands for I want vegans to be healthy. If you're gonna, I want everyone to be healthy. But this is in 14 years, the first time in the last, I want to say two years now, maybe three, that clients are coming to me consistently. Like I get emails on a consistent basis saying, I've been vegan for this many years. I'm, I've got high blood pressure, high cholesterol, um, high uh, blood sugars, um, obesity, can't lose weight. These are things we never saw before. Like it was, those are things that are shown in the literature associated with a reduced risk for those factors and people get off medications for those actual things that are happening and this is the first half of vegan diets why because i the reason i became a, a dietitian because i love to look at what people eat so i you know i go and that's how i kind of know what's going on with them so i always have them do food journal without without exception it's because they're including the vegan ice creams and the vegan burgers and the vegan cheeses and i mean so on one side, it's great that it's an option, as you said, like a bridge for someone that would have gone to the fast food restaurant and had a burger and fries. I'd rather them have a plant-based burger and fries. 
but it's not something that anyone should be eating on a regular basis in terms of health. And we're gonna see in the literature in a few years, we're gonna see this unfold where when you compare an omnivore to a vegetarian to a vegan, which is what a lot of the um, those epidemiological studies show or the observational studies show, you're not gonna see a difference between the meat eaters and the vegans because I'm starting to see it already on a one-to-one -one basis. So that's my concern. Mm -hmm. So do, so you do think it's a step in the right direction or maybe not even a step in the right direction? Do you think some people are better off or just as well off eating their uh, burger? I can't say that. I can't say that. I mean, I can't. I can't honestly say that because I'm, I'm sure there are definitely environmental um, implications or animal implications or other implications outside of health. But from a health standpoint, from a dietitian standpoint, because I always say I'm not an ethicist, I'm not, you know, this is not what I teach. I, I'm, I want to make people healthier. From that standpoint, you know, if you're, if you're going to go to fast food, I'd rather you have the plant version. If, if you have the choice, I'd rather you just eat uh, something healthy at home or at a restaurant that's, that's vegetables, fruits, whole grains, legumes, mushrooms, nuts, seeds, herbs, and spices. You know, not, not a processed food. Mm -hmm. Good answer. Good answer. So I, I want to get into uh, your, some of your great books that you've authored over the years. Um, the one that I really appreciate is The Vegetarian Diet, which is, you know, really great because it's obviously a spin off the Mediterranean diet, which so many people, which is the, the, the diet that is studied the most in terms of uh, nutritional sciences and clinical studies around nutrition. But there's a lot of misconceptions as to what the healthy aspects of the Mediterranean diet are, and you point those out. Um, so what inspired you to tackle this huge topic of the Mediterranean diet and uh, you know, pursue writing this book that, that put it all out there in a way that people can kind of have a closer look at this large diet that's, that's studied around, uh, around the world? So it's the Mediterranean diet always comes out as number one, US, diet, US News best diet of the year, it's the best diet. And I was always like, well, why is that the number one diet when the research is like, okay, we reduced you know, cardiovascular, you know, like a secondary, like a heart attack with, you know, in 30% of the cases versus a regular diet. I mean, that's, the research is not so amazing. It's not as amazing as they put it out to be. So I was like, well, why is that when we see a plant-based diet literally reversing advanced stage cardiovascular disease and type 2 diabetes. The only, that's like the only diet that's ever really done that. How could that not be so obviously, you know, the number one gold standard? Because to me it is. It just it doesn't, I, there's no question when you actually look at it. So I started to pick it apart and I really want to redo this book actually because I want to do all the Ansel Keys and all that stuff because there's so much good information that I didn't go into all the controversy and speaking of wanting to be disruptive, I really want to go back and kind of do a little bit more disruptive with that. And actually I've converted this into a lecture that I give where I did dive into that because I think that's so important with the whole butter is back thing and the whole carnivore craze now. But that said, from what I did look at at the time, it's been a few years, was, you know, everyone says, oh, well, the Mediterranean diet is so healthy because, you know, olive oil. And so people are just like looking the olive oil all over the, you know, bottle of olive oil in hand when they're cooking and eating salads or whatever, or adding it to their meat-based dishes um, or the fish. It's the fish. We need to eat more fish. Or, and the third one is the red wine. I always say I love a glass of wine as much as most people, but you know, you need to have 10, I think it's 10,000 bottles or a thousand liters of red wine to get the resveratrol benefits that we know um, you, better, you better get drinking. <laughs> <laughs> I always say, I think you won't really care about your cholesterol by the point of finishing that amount of alcohol. Oh but, boy, yeah. Um, yeah, but it's really not. That's not the reason it was originally looked at as so healthful. What was originally why it looked so healthful is pretty much the blue zone idea. It's really a whole food plant-based diet. Meat consumption at the time when they originally were studying it in the 50s and 60s was like 10% of calories very small amount of animal products, mostly for you know celebrations and holidays and stuff like that. But mostly it was a plant-based diet. And the reason the olive oil they got away with it, it looks like that they were healthy, not because of the olive oil, but in spite of the olive oil, because this was times of scarcity. You know, This is the first time in the last 50 years where we are living in times of 
abundance and chronic overnutrition. But back then when they were really analyzing this for the first time, these were, this was like post World War II. It was, you know, it was torn from the war. And so people were, you know, they needed more calories and olives. They had a lot of olives in the Mediterranean. They still do. And they concentrated it into oil and it was a concentrated source of energy. And so those are the, I think the main reasons that the Mediterranean diet looks so healthful or originally did is because it was mostly plant-based. Interestingly, nowadays they've, they've revisited it and these people in the original cohorts that have, they're like, they're a lot older now, I think eighties and nineties, they are, they are eating, you know, the way we're eating and their health benefits are just not the same. They have basically, we've all caught up. So the Mediterranean diet, you, you, you're, you're saying that the Mediterranean diet currently is not the Mediterranean diet that the science portrays. It's not the traditional Mediterranean the diet. Traditional Mediterranean. No, yeah, the all, even Okinawa, you know, unfortunately, because Okinawa has astonishing, when they were studying that too, there's a great book and some great, article, great articles on the Okinawa diet where one of the healthiest diets ever, the traditional diet, and they had another one of the blue zones and they were eating, you know, lots of sweet potato was like a main staple and a lot very very heavy plant-based diet and they were active and they were but their diet has completely changed and so has their disease incidence even those blue zones are are subject to all of the same potential lifestyle environmental things that you know are plaguing the rest of the world that's kind of that's sad to know because it what the blue zones and i had it in my mind that they were like the the pristine you know where where the, the optimal you know laws of nature were abided by by most of the citizens that live there, but they're forgetting the basics. They are. It's it's really sad. It's happening everywhere yeah. in the world. You know, it's it's happening everywhere. We're eating. We're Americanizing or Westernizing. We can't even say that anymore. We can't say the standard Western diet anymore because it's everywhere. I spent a lot of time in Asia last year. And uh, it's happening in Asia. It's happening everywhere. And it's this, you know, there's fast food everywhere and people are incorporating meat and fried foods where they never were before. And it's very affordable now to have all that because of the way animal products are produced and the way these cheap foods are produced and people are eating it and getting just as sick as one would expect. So it's, it's really kind of concerning, especially now that, what is it, one in three in the world are overweight or obese. And in America now it's 70%, like almost three out of four people are overweight or obese. Like that's never happened. In 2011 was the first time in recorded history that there's more chronic overnutrition than than undernutrition and malnutrition from undernutrition ever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right? think yeah, things are a little bit different. Well, back back to the Mediterranean diet for a little bit. Um, so people are obviously focusing on the red wine and the olive oil and the fish and these kind of things that you, you're talking about. People are healthy in the Mediterranean in spite of, not because of these things. Do you think that it's just the, the newspaper articles and the blog posts and those things that blow up and inflate these aspects of the Mediterranean diet? Or are there some scientific papers that do that? Uh, no, it's media, it's interpretation, it's context, like I said, like it's not like that anymore. And really it's not that they were sitting there eating olive oil with their, you know, fast food meal, they were eating a whole food plant-based. Like there's all, if you really look at what they were eating, it was a whole food plant-based diet. I talk about like the synergy of all those plant foods, incorporating all the different nutrients, all the fiber and phytonutrients that are exclusively found in plants and the, um, you know, uh, swapping out the stuff, the animal products that have all the, like it's basically reducing the intake of saturated fat and heme iron and TMAO or carnitine and all these little compounds that we know promote inflammation and and decrease health span and longevity. So it's it's really not it's really interpretive, I think. Okay. Yeah, I I, I think so as well. I'm just curious based on the you know the depth that you dove into in that book. Um, because you know, I always love the the quote. I, I think it was Michael Greger who talks about people loving good news about their bad habits. And I think originally that was McDougal. He always says oh, that that's okay. such a true statement. You know, people love to hear good news about what they want to hear. Right. So whenever, <laughs> like, what red wine? I'll have 10,000 glasses or whatever you said. <laughs> yeah. Cool. So 
And then um, I know you've got a newer book just around the corner, The Health Span Solution, which sounds really fun. And what's the, the obviously it sounds like you're talking about um, increasing the health span, which a lot of people focus on lifespan and just like the, the years that you live rather than the, the life in the years. Exactly. Something like that. So what is the health span solution? Yeah, it's so funny. It's exactly what we say. We want to add life to your years, not years to your life. I mean, right. ideally, you know, you want to, nobody wants to live long because we're living longer or as long because we've got these great therapies. You know, you could, you know, cut open the heart and put in a stent and save the day. We have great medications. We have all sorts of things that are happening from a medical perspective, but that doesn't mean people, you know, like who wants to live in a, you know, home where you're um, debilitated and not able to, you know, do healthy, wonderful things. So on that side, you know, we want, we looked at the health span research and really we want to enhance health span and we want people to, we always say, and like our opening, I think one of our opening sentences is you're not going to live forever by eating carrots. We're not claiming that, you know, it's not, this is not like, oh, you're going to live forever. It's the magic bullet. It's the magic pill that's going to save your life forever. But it is what we see in the health span research is that a plant-based diet perfectly fits into it because the only way we've ever extended health span and longevity in all organisms ever tested from yeast and flies and roundworms to our primate cousins, you know, the rhesus macaques, there's two really great studies going on on them. The only way we've ever enhanced uh, health span and longevity is with dietary restriction without malnutrition, specifically essential amino acid restriction. So an easy way to do that, a real natural way to do that is eating more plants and just eating lots of plants. And, and, um, and it's like the win-win because you get hmm. to eat plenty of food and enjoy eating and, and then you could also have all of those health benefits. So just to reiterate what you're saying, so I think I understand it, essential amino acid restriction. So essentially restricting protein and um, the highest amounts of protein are from meat. So is that, is that, that's really the focus of a low protein diet for health span. Yeah. And it's dietary restriction total. So, you know, restricting everything like eating calorie restriction, calorie restriction. But when you really look at it, it looks like it is the amino acids. That is the reason for it. And Dr. Geiger actually on nutrition facts has a great series. I actually put it on my YouTube channel, um, the series of talking about why, and like there's things with methionine, there's certain amino acids that basically enhance like a uh, you know disease process a disease process so lowering that decreasing that seems to be the key to everything we're unlocking in terms of health span and you know there's all this really interesting research coming out on time restricted feeding and like implementing that in different kind of techniques into your day-to-day -day life and so that's kind of what we're doing and so what Ray and I have done is this is my first I'm so excited because my first like hardcover full color cookbook and it's like, I'm so excited because we just finished the, they did a photo shoot last, they finished last week and you know, all these beautiful photos, it's DK publishing. So I've always wanted this, like my dream come true to have awesome my recipes. Yeah. Because you know, people complain, oh, there's no pictures in this book. And uh, it's like, you can't really control that with an idiot's guide and the vegetarian, they couldn't, they didn't do pictures either. But you know, when you see recipes, you want to see the pictures and it's, I'm just really excited. So it's over a hundred recipes, but we we're also being really disruptive here. So this book is, the first three chapters are so sciencey. Like I've never, we're gonna see how much we can get away with because we're going into edits this week. But um, we just put in everything, like all the how and why, everything about nutrition and health span in three chapters at the beginning. And then, then there's a hundred recipes to kind of, you know, how to do it. So we, we also did, we didn't do breakfast, lunch, dinner, snacks, desserts. We're doing soup, salad, sides, and sweets. So That's awesome. Yeah. yeah, different. Awesome. So it sounds like it's almost uh, people could probably get it just as a cookbook if they're not really into the into the science. So it's your kind of uh, catering to to both sides of the brain, I guess you could say the left side, the left sided brain, left brain people, and the right brain people. Yes, exactly. Like we're hoping there's something for everyone in there because we just we want we want to be able to say here this is how and why and here's what you can make and you know a hundred different ways to do so. But we wanted we wanted to keep it simple, but we're also um, 
we're trying to break some rules, but we really looked, but everything is evidence-based and you'll see it. We have like, I don't know, 250, 300 references in there. Hopefully that all gets to stay too. That's the other thing I finally got to do. I didn't get to do with my idiots guys was put in all the references, but um, it's been fun. And you know, Ray is an incredible scientist and he also has trained culinarily. So it's been, it's been a really exciting project and we're, we're excited about it. That's so cool. And you know what, so it sounds like some of the science is really focusing on that, that protein stuff, lowering the protein and the reasons for doing that and how to do that. Um, and what just, you know, popped into my mind is, is, uh, just considering that on most food labels, it, it like exponentially, you know, puts in your face, Oh, this has 35 grams of protein. And I just, you know, had a, a flash of vision of, only six grams of protein, you know, just kind of totally flipping the, the trend upside down and focusing on lower protein, which would be amazing. And it seems like we might be heading in that direction. You know, I don't, I don't know if I'll ever see that in my lifetime. <laughs> it would be like quite the unseating of this really deep, deep passion people have for protein. Like this pursuit of protein is I believe getting in the way of a lot of people eating yeah. healthy and we call it macro confusion. That's what we talk about. That's actually how our work came together because we are both simultaneously going around the world saying the same crazy, like protein's not a food group. And people are looking at us like, what are you talking about? But I think that's where we call it. It's that is where the confusion comes in. And I don't think people need to look for low protein. We just think you don't even need to think about protein. We don't want you to think about protein. We, we really want to switch the conversation back to food back to, we always say vegetables, fruits, whole grains, legumes, mushrooms, nuts, seeds, herbs, and spices, because that's what we want you to eat. You don't have to think about protein. You don't, and like you said, I didn't go, I didn't say, I just remember that you had commented that meat is a concentrated source of protein. Right. And so if you're not having that and you're just eating whole plant foods, you're going to get all the amino acids. You know, every amino acid is found in every plant. So you're going to get it. But I don't think anyone needs to worry about that. And I don't think anyone needs to replace meat with a protein powder. I have my clients, including all of our athletes, get off of protein powders. Like we don't need more protein. And I think we can stop thinking about that and stop worrying about all the macros because that's really become a big thing now. Like people are, like they call it macros. Like people email me, oh, I need help. Which macros, you know, what, how do I manage my macros? I'm like, stop thinking about your macros. Just eat food and you're going to be fine. Mm, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's really the take home, right? It's just like, look at food as what it is. It's, it's a uh, whole and complete in and of itself. We don't need to break it down and, you know, measure things and see that we're getting enough. That's, that's really what I hear you saying. Yes. Yeah. But, but that being said, you're, you know, you're an RD, you have this training in, uh, you know, sci nutritional science and, and I, and I trust that at points with some clients, you do dive into some tracking of things, you know, from a, healing perspective and seeing how to optimize the body and allowing it to heal itself so so how do you balance the you know just eat food to like the the clients that you might have that are suffering from various digestive issues or autoimmune issues or whatever you're working with uh regularly like how, how do you specialize or individualize a diet to support that person in healing Good question. So I don't have anyone track. I have people track their food journal. I want to see what they're eating, but I'm looking at it from a qualitative perspective. I'm not counting anything. You know, I'll put stuff into chronometer or whatever for, you know, like just to know, but we don't, you don't need to. So I look for, I have, I have something called the six day degrees, which helps uh, prioritize foods that I want people to try to consume on a regular basis because they are so unique nutritionally. So for instance, I want people to eat legumes every day. I want people to have about one to one and a half cups of beans, any bean, lentil, soy foods. I always say hummus should be a food group because that counts in there too. Um, but any kind of legume, peas, all of those things count. But those are something that's kind of unique, nutritionally speaking, and it's something that's really important, um, really high in fiber and all these other things that are just necessary. And then the other one is nuts and seeds. I want people to have one and one to two ounces of nuts and seeds per day, 30 to 40 grams. So this is, there's a litany of research showing the benefits of eating one to two ounces of nuts and seeds a day. So also unique um, nutrient profile, getting your essential fats and all of that. Uh, and then 
leafy green and cruciferous vegetables, incredibly healthy, incredibly chock full of these phytonutrients that you can't really get as concentrated as you can in those foods. And, you know, we always say they're so low in calorie and so high in nutrition that you could eat them in basically unlimited quantities. And they're just really good for your, your gut microbiome, infinite reasons, all of these foods are. But so leafy greens, cruciferous, that's one, nuts and seeds, legumes, and then other colored vegetables, you know, orange, dark orange and red, because you want to make sure you're getting all your carotenoids, all those things. Uh, and the other one is fruits. So three servings of fruits a day too. So those are the six daily threes. And the sixth one is movement exercise. So I have that as kind of one of those things to prioritize too. And we don't even like say you need to do hardcore hits or, you know, crossed fit or whatever. It's just, just move every day. Cause in the blue zones and the healthiest populations, it's about being active, not hardcore exerciser as to compare to sedentary. Uh, so I have people kind of prioritize on that uh, when I'm looking at their, you know, optimizing their diet. I also take into consideration supplementation. You know, I want to make sure everyone's on B12. I start, I moved, when I first started 14 years ago, I was like very adamant about B12 is probably fine, maybe D, but I'm, you know, I'm seeing more and more. I started advocating for a multi, a gentle multi, because iodine is not necessarily the same in all plants. It's kind of harder to gauge and we're seeing a lot of thyroid things come up lately. I'm um, also looking at zinc can be a little harder for people to get, especially if they're not doing the one to two ounces of nuts and seeds a day and the legumes every day. Um, so I started recommending a multi, like a, not a crazy multi, like there's some that I recommend um, just to cover your bases and not have to worry. But I think this is apropos for pretty much no matter what you're eating. What mm -hmm. kind of so uh, on the topic of that multi, is it, uh, do you, re you recommend, I presume, like a food-based multivitamin or? Yes. Yeah. Because there's certain things I don't like, like I don't like folic acid is not, yeah. it's not that I don't like, but the research kind of supports some. It's, it's like not real. It's not, you know, it's not what the, it's not what the body knows as being beneficial. Yeah. Yeah. And it actually has some harmful, like mm -hmm. associated with it. But, um, though I, you know, I do, I don't have any, you know, paid reason to say this, <laughs> but I really do like Dr. Furman's formula. So we have our clients do the women's or the men's formula or the kids formula for the children, just cause it's gentle. It's not like high in some of these multis are like really like 900% of your vitamin A. And that's, you know, just cause something's good doesn't mean more is better. And I like that he has <laughs> everything scientifically kind of research. I really kind of, I like his research and, and how he makes his decisions. So. Yeah. So I'm curious about, uh, it sounds like you have everyone complete a food journal of some sort, which I think is, a, it's really an insightful process to get a good, you know, clean look at what's actually going in my mouth. Because I know when I sit down and talk with someone and I say, well, you know, what does your diet look like? Oh, you know, just like fruits and vegetables and, <laughs> and you know, optimally healthy. Uh, so it's good to actually you know, consider what's coming in your mouth. But in, in your experience, how is that process for individuals to complete a diet journal, a food journal? Like, is it something that people resist? Is it something that people lie in and <laughs> stretch the truth in some way? And, uh, you know, what is your experience kind of professionally in working with food journals and stuff? I would say it is one of the best tools that we have in our armamentarium. Like it's one of the best tools that anyone could have and anyone can utilize. And, if, and it doesn't have to be like, I, you don't have to, like I tell my client, just write a list. I just want the time of day, estimate. I say, use your hand as a, your fist as a cup and your thumb as a tablespoon, but it doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't have to be measured. And I get, yes, I get all sorts of people. Some are really resistant. Some are like, oh, cause I won't see anyone unless they show me what they're eating. Cause everyone says, oh, I eat healthy. Yeah. Yeah. So what I've noticed is that no matter where they're at, once they've done it, it's the best tool for accountability because you're like, oh, do I really want to eat that? Because I have to write it down. You know, you're being accountable to the food journal, especially if you know your dietitian's going to read it. But also just knowing yourself, it's like you have to read it later. It's going to be there forever. Hmm. It's a really good tool for accountability, really good research tool. So nowadays, allergies and intolerances are so common and so widespread for multiple different reasons. And isolating what is actually at the source of that can be very complicated. And I'm sure you know that a lot of people, the, the real, the most accurate way, even beyond blood tests and scratch tests, are is an elimination diet, which is barbaric. <laughs> it's like eat brown rice and bananas for two weeks and then add in one food at a time for every few days. And it's so hard to do and it's so tedious. So this, I think. I always start with a food journal instead, and I have a food and symptom journal for someone that's kind of exploring to try to discern what could be the issue. 
So I think it's an amazing tool for a lot of reasons. And I think most people are pleasantly surprised. Some people are, think it's arduous and it's, you know, a lot, it is, it can be, but you know, I think it's very, very, very helpful. And you don't have to do it all the time, but I think if you're exploring something or you're trying to figure out what's going on digestively or symptom wise for any of the other things or people that have maybe eczema flare ups, it's a really good tool to assess. Yeah, no, I, I certainly agree. Some of the, the pushback that I receive is around, uh, you know, food addictions or food or eating disorders or, or things like that. How do you communicate and relate with people around, uh, around these kind of like eating disorder tendencies? Because I know that, you know, tracking things and being really conscientious of that things can, can trigger obsessive compulsive behaviors and, and stuff like that. You have so many good questions. I, you really do. Very Thanks. Obviously doing this. I do not work with eating disorders. I've always kind of, it's not my expertise. I always feel like it's really a psychology department type of thing because a lot of times people that come to me know more about nutrition or, you know, know as much about nutrition as I do. And they're, it's, it's not a nutrition deficit. It's more of a behavioral, emotional kind of a world. And I don't feel an expert in that. So I, do, I try to not work with people that are trying to focus on that. Um, and yes, if it's triggering, like, I don't, know, I don't know how to deal with it. It's just not my expertise. So I usually refer out for that. Um, that said, I've noticed a large increase in prevalence of eating disorder. Maybe it's just an inquiry type of thing. I'm just getting more people in, inquiring. But I'm also hearing a lot of, more about it lately. So I don't know. I don't know what that's all about. I find it kind of intriguing. Um, you know, maybe we, we really believe and we work with, with Ray and I, with our lifestyle transformation company, we were, we're very careful about who we'll work with because it's so intensive and you have to be kind of ready for it because you will, you know, everyone loses 0.6 to 0.8 pounds a day. Everyone does, uh, but it's very intense. So we have to kind of be careful of who we work with because we don't want any of those things, but we've seen that it's the food, it's the food that's the problem. You know, people kind of blame themselves and it's really these high, we've never been in a world where we have access to hyper palatable foods 24 hours a day everywhere. And it's so socially normal to be eating all the time and you can't celebrate anything without food as a centerpiece. So I think we believe that it's environmental and it's not people. So I think that maybe that's why we're seeing an on, you know, an increase in that is because there's just so much access and it's so normalized to eat all the time that people are, you know, it's just, it's environmental, not personal, I think. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you. I think that opting to a natural diet, a whole food plant-based diet allows people to reconnect with their natural hunger trigger cues and, you know, allows their taste buds to recalibrate and, you know, resensitize and can actually therefore help cure any sort of underlying eating disorder that's triggered by excessive dopamine surges or, you know, these kind of social uh, norms that, that we live in. So, so it sounds like you, you're really just addressing the food. And if there is some kind of underlying psychological stuff, that's not in your, you know, wheelhouse of working with those kind of people. Yeah, or what we do, and what I'm learning from Ray is really just saying, no, this is not you, you're not broken. You're not broken. And that message, not only is it so resonant, you know, for a lot of people, um, I, and personally, like, I, it's so resonant for me, because I, you know, I love eating that junk food. Like, I love that stuff. Like, it's so easy to overeat on that. Like, once I'm, when I'm out at a restaurant, it's got all that yummy salt and oil and sugar and all that stuff. It's just so easy to overeat it, like pizzas or whatever, like all the, um, but when I'm eating whole foods, it's like, you get full so much faster. It's just harder to overeat. So it, it really is this whole message of you're not broken. It's the food. I think that's very powerful. And I think it really resonates with a lot of people that may have thought that they have an eating disorder. And we work through, like we work through that with them in our program and they realize, oh my gosh, I don't, I'm not broken. It was the food. So it's, it's empowering too. Yeah, I think that is, I'm, I'm so happy that you said that because that's really my, my approach to all mental health issues. You know, a lot of people just chalk up normal human tendencies to be in some sort of disorder or diagnosis or disease or problem. 
where I think, uh, you know, my, my approach to, to eating disorders and also and anxiety and depression and everything else that's human is just to recognize that it's all part of being human and, and to normalize other things that for whatever reason have been, you know, demonized or, or, uh, you know, apologize. You know, just, yeah. Not accepted in whatever way. So that's great. I'm, I'm great, grateful that you shared that important part of just everything is not broken or and nothing is broken in, uh, in an individual. Um, so you, you talked a little bit about your lifestyle transformation program. I'm, I'm intrigued what that, what that looks like. And, um, it sounds like it's something that you and Ray do together, which is super cool. So walk, walk me through that. So I, I've been doing like one-on-one -on -one counseling or like one-on couples, one-on families, you know, like I work with people privately like this, like I'll have, we do Skype or FaceTime or phone and um, people come to me with a, di a recent diagnosis. Uh, I work with people with diabetes and cardiovascular disease and hypertension, all that stuff. I work with people that just want to eat a plant-based diet. So transforming that. And I was working with people with like, you know, if they wanted to lose a few pounds or weight loss. But when I started working with Ray, we, we put our heads together. It's been almost exactly three years. And September, end of September will be three years. And we started doing kind of everything together. And so he already had this program in place. I kind of helped him, you know, flesh it out. And if you will, <laughs> pun intended. And um, it's basically we have, an, it's an automated program, but, and then we're there coaching. <clears throat> so it's a coaching program, but it's, it's really mostly for people that want to lose. The ideal patient for this or client for this is someone that has 30 to 60 pounds to lose. We do work with people that have more to lose, but um, it's basically a complete transformation because it's people coming from eating any kind of diet to no, we're gonna we're going into it, and it's very intense and it's very you know it takes six to 12 weeks depending 30 to 60 pounds, and it's everyone. What was shocking to me was after working one on one and after learning in grad school. Oh, everyone's a little different. Everyone's got their little nuances. No, no, not so much. We are all so much alike. And like we started four women around the same age ish. I'm not even kidding. Every day we got uh, texts from all four women with the same exact thing. Like constipation happened the same day or cravings happened the same day or they were in the new size jeans the same day. Like it was so predictable that it blew my mind. It was such a predictable program. So we are very human. We are very much the same. And if you follow what we do, cause it's, you know, we, we leak out our recipes and it's a very strategic program that Ray kind of started, you know, many years ago before me. And it, it revolutionized things I was doing with weight loss. So I no longer do weight loss separately unless it's five to 10 pounds or whatever and just transformation. But this is like major life-changing kind of thing. And I don't know if you know Penn Jillette from Penn and Teller, you know, from the magician in Vegas. Mm -mm. So he, Ray put him through the program and he wrote a whole book about it called Presto, how I made a hundred pounds magically disappear because he was really, really sick with high blood pressure. And the doctors said, we're either going to do a gastric bypass or that's it, you're going to die. And so he went to Ray and Ray walked him through the program and it worked. So he wrote a whole book about kind of like, you know, uh -huh, cool. Yeah. <laughs> From a magician perspective. Yeah. I mean, he's yeah. hilarious and very smart man. So it was a really interesting, it's an interesting, it's a funny book. It's a funny take on what we do. So is this program something in person and immersive sort of thing for six weeks or 12 weeks or, or what? Yeah, no, not yet. So we want to do, we want, we're working on building our app so that we can take on more clients because we have to unfortunately say no to a lot of people just because there's just the two of us right now. Mm -hmm. But we are, it's automated online. So you get emails like once or twice a day and then we're there texting you and we have like weekly phone calls. So right now it's, it's all automated. People could do it anywhere. And um, we want to do like immersions and stuff like that too. Like we do, we're doing plant rate based retreats. Like we did um, two weeks in Thailand last January. We just released our dates for this January where you're coming and learning plant-based cooking and um, how to eat this way. And we do health span lectures. So those are the in-person things we're doing now. We hope to do more of those in the future. But on um, that program specifically is you're on your own. And we work with a lot of like executives and even senators. We've worked with all sorts of people that are traveling the world and working on and like have, you know, it's hard to do that. It's hard to take the side six to 12 weeks to, to set aside to do this. So we help them do that in the middle of their crazy, busy life. That's really great because I think a lot of people just have their long list of excuses. Oh, I'll change that stuff that's causing me to feel this way, you know, 
next month or next week, after I finish this, after the kids go back to school, after, you know, whatever, there's always a time to put it off. Yes. So it sounds like you, <laughs> you dissolve all of those excuses and just lead people into their health transformation, regardless of where they're at. Well, but exactly. And, but they have to be ready. Yeah. Exactly. But yeah, but yeah, there is no Monday. We're not waiting till Monday. <laughs> when you're ready, we're going to do it. And we will give you unyielding accountability, you know, no matter what. Super cool. Well, I've got like a few kind of uh, point and shoot questions have bubbled up and I'd like to end with, you know, just a few things. Um, blending, smoothies. You a fan? Yay or nay? I know there's like two camps. Yeah, I used to be like a big, that was how I started. Like my first cooking demo video was, was green smoothies. I was really big into green smoothies. I'm, I don't think they're bad for you by any means. I don't think they're good when you're trying to lose weight or if you're trying to, I don't think there's something you need to eat. I think it's a great way for people to get fruits and vegetables into their diet if they're not eating them. It's a great way to get an on the go meal. I went from like saying, yeah, start with a green smoothie because it is kind of a gateway food. Like people start with green smoothies and they end up going towards a plant-based diet. I've seen that quite a lot. In fact, I, that probably contributed to my journey too. But uh, I would say they're not required. They're not bad. They can be wonderful. Depends what you put in them. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm neutral on it and I've got, I could advise on how to optimize them. Um, but I think they can be wonderful additions to a healthy diet. Mm -hmm. How about canned beans? Is that something that people, you know, I, I keep canned beans just as a very rainy day kind of thing, but should we be worried about, you know, phytates and lectins and canned beans or anything like that? <laughs> oh, the oh, lectin cool. word. You went there. <laughs> No, I, I always use canned beans. I have tons, of, I, I live on canned beans because they're way more convenient. I love fresh beans, freshly made beans. They taste so much better and they're cheaper and they're great, but I travel so much. So for me, it's just easy to have canned beans. I do tend to get the, I get the BPA free. I get the low sodium or the no sodium ones. Um, I like organic sometimes, but it doesn't really matter that much. So yeah, canned beans are great. Fresh beans are better compared to what I just want to make sure you're getting your beans. It's so important that there's, there's no reason not to have canned. And then there was another part of that that I missed. What else did you say uh, about beans? Well, the oh, lectin, lectin. The, but you could, your reaction to it kind of spoke right to it, which <laughs> <laughs> I feel like we don't need to, for, for anyone that's watching, we don't need to at least uh, expound upon that. that. I mean, that could be a whole nother hour. <laughs> yeah, but I could say one thing about this whole yeah, lectin for thing. Sure. Crazy, ridiculous book that came out that is so crazy. The only thing in common, the one thing in common that all the blue zones have, they all include legumes as a foundational food. Legumes are fantastic. There's nothing wrong with lectins. And actually, again, Nutrition Facts, Dr. Gregor did a great video on why that book, I can't even say the name because it's so awful, why it's so <laughs> bad and so wrong. Yeah. Well, if you know, if you don't eat beans, then we can sell you this prebiotic fiber that, you know, will help you, right? right. <laughs> Right, you could pay a hundred dollars a month to, you know. Oh, it's just so crazy to me. Yeah. yeah. Um, there was one other thing. Oh yeah, do you have a favorite kind of bar or kind of on the go traveling snack that can uh, give you some calories and some nutrition, or are you so opposed to anything that's like shaped like a bar and comes in a package? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I used to be a big advocate. I have recipes in all my books for bars that you could make with just, I always said just fruit, dried fruit and nuts and seeds without all the added, you know, fancy stuff. But, um, but now what I'm learning with this time restricted feeding and with this whole, most people come to me for chronic overnutrition that, that we don't, you know, we are always eating. It's like that when I, I fly all the time in that half an hour flight where we go up and come down and even in that 30 minutes, they have to have a snack. It's like, or the gas stations that have food. It's like, you don't need to always have food on the go. That said, there are people that do. There are some populations that do probably need to eat more often. So if I had to choose, I would definitely say, you know, just make sure it's all just dried fruit and nuts and seeds. I would do hummus and veggies are great to go snacks. Um, you know, fruit is a natural, perfect, you know, naturally born <laughs> on the go kind of a food. Um, but there's, you know, it depends on what your goals are. You don't need to go for the one that says 37 grams of protein. No. Okay. Yeah. We, we know that by now. 
Um, cool. Well, I'm, I'm so happy to have connected and learned more about your, your, your practice and how you support people and your, you know, your journey through this health nutrition world and really grateful for the work that you're doing. And uh, yeah, any, any last kind of uh, words of wisdom or advice for maybe someone who's nutritionally curious about, you know, stepping into uh, a healthier way of, of living, specifically focusing on what's on their plate? Well, first of all, thank you so much. And thank you for all of your really, really good questions. They were unique for me. Um, I would say not to be concerned, like don't let perfect get in your way. Like I would say, you really just find delicious meals that composed of vegetables, fruits, whole grains, legumes, mushrooms, nuts, seeds, herbs, and spices in the infinite tasty combinations that you can get. And don't, it doesn't have to be perfect. Like we are creatures of habit, right? We, we rotate through only a few mere menu items every week. Like most of us eat pretty much the same thing every day. So just replace what you're eating and just eat more of those whole plant foods find recipes you love and just, you know, have fun with it. Make it a fun, positive experience and the benefits will follow. Excellent. Well, I can tell that's definitely been your personal approach. You seem like a very fun, lively person. And it, it seems like that's carrying you into your health in addition to obviously your, li your lifestyle and, all, and your food and all those things are being so important. So anyways, thank you so much again. And, uh, hope everyone can find you i'm sure i know you've got a website do you want to rattle it off real quick sure yeah thank you so much yeah, yeah it's plantbaseddietitian.com and um, i'm plantbased dietitian on facebook and plant dietitian on twitter and on instagram i'm my name juliana havert which is really hard to spell <laughs> Julie i know it, it is it's like julie juliana stuck together right exactly yeah, yeah so but yep that's where you can find me and then the health span solution is going to be out when what's the uh projected date of that not projected it's officially on amazon it's but official. don't look yet yes because our photo is going up next week so hold on but it's um it's publishing on december 17th okay so it might be open for pre-order or something like that or open for pre-order already we just saw it on amazon the other day we got so excited but i'm waiting i'm, I'm waiting to show it to my mom and dad and sister and they're like my mom's like i just bought it was i the first one and my sister's like i just bought it am i the second one i'm like oh way to go family but yeah, yeah. it's available for pre-order and we'll be announcing it as soon as the, the beautiful photos that, that they just got up so thank you awesome all right well looking forward to checking it out and uh thanks again and peace and love and we'll check you guys next time Thank you.